I would say the profile of the Green Cross is quite unique because there are hundreds and maybe thousands of organizations dealing with the issues of sustainable development. Usually these organizations are doing a very useful work, but uh, uh, sometimes it's difficult to understand the difference. Green Cross works on the critical nexus between the issues of security, uh, poverty eradication and environmental degradation. And uh, I do not think that uh, there are organizations, at least uh, non-governmental organizations, with a similar profile. As uh, Winston Churchill said, uh, the optimist sees an opportunity in any problem, while pessimist sees the problem in any opportunity. So, uh, but being an optimist, I think that we need constantly adapt our organization to the uh, speedily changing world today. We are entering into the global water crisis. Every day, 10,000 people die because of the water shortages or bad water. We help people to have access to the fresh water. We help people to save water due to uh, uh, rain harvesting in Bolivia, for instance. And uh, uh, with the bigger projects, we help the communities to find a solution, solutions to the conflicts that sometimes um, uh, turn out or explode as a result of the mismanagement of the water resources or the other, other natural resources development. Fifteen years ago, when we've started the activities of Green Cross, it was even unimaginable that governments will rate environmental issues, uh, I would say, in parallel to the problems of humanitarian consequences of wars and conflicts. Therefore, I think one of the strategic achievements of Green Cross uh, is the fact that we have convinced the international community that the relief operations should be done in parallel for human being and for environment. And that is being done now, even uh, due to uh, this work, the United Nations have created a joint unit of uh, several uh, entities, UN entities that deal with humanitarian activities and environmental as well. Mahatma Gandhi once said that there is one major social sin, and that's faith without sacrifice. And we're not ready to sacrifice even simplest conveniences. There is only 10% of the people that are ready to change their lifestyles according to their beliefs, whether it be religion, uh, political convictions, or environmental beliefs. The rest of the people should be guided to the necessary solutions. And I think that it is the responsibility to a certain extent of the legislature to create the necessary norms that will motivate people. It's not necessarily, you know, fines and something, but tax exemption, if you use solar batteries or something like that, there should be motivation to become sustainable. How many people do switch off their television sets in the big city? I mean, completely not just running this convenient red light of the remote control on and on during day and night. But you will be surprised that if you take a multi-million city, that uh, the energy that is needed to feed this very uh, convenient red light on the remote controls is equal to the energy produced by a medium a nuclear power station. So just cut it off and then the government might consider not to build another nuclear power 